Can everyone hear me okay? Good, thank you. So as I mentioned, uh, I'd like to talk about intention and action, or as the Buddha um, defined it as karma, karma. Uh, tonight and I've been thinking about uh, I guess the imperative that many of us feel to act right now in the world with so much going on around climate change, ecological collapse, bushfires, the Black Lives Matter movement um, and Indigenous affairs in our, in, our, in our own country and so I've been pondering all of this and thinking about what it is that um, propels us to act as citizens of the world, especially at such a time, and also what, what gives meaning right now in, in this time of turmoil. And also thinking about what, in a Dharma context, what gives us, um, gives foundation to our actions and provides this um, foundation for the ways in which we think and speak and act in the world. So I've gone back to the Buddha's teachings on, on intention and action and uh, had a nice time reading and, and re-familiarising myself with, this, with these teachings. And of course, it's impossible to um, to narrow all this down to a, a 30 minute talk, but this is my little take on it this week. So I think a powerful, one powerful way to reflect on, on how we act in the world is to uh, reflect on our motivations and intentions. What is the impetus of our thinking and action? And I think this sort of, delves into the question of, you know, why do we think like we think about certain things? And um, why do we act regarding certain things and ignore others? And regarding intention, the Buddha taught that this intention or another word for another good um, uh, translation for karma is, uh, oh, sorry, Chetana, is um, volition, that this provides the backbone or the forerunner of all action, which is karma. And it's what propels uh, our action forward. The teacher Joseph Goldstein uh, says that volition carries the karmic force of the action. So this is the seed within the action itself. And intention in the Buddha Dharma is related to cultivating an ethical life. So it's, it's a, an orientation, it's a purposeful foundation that has at its centre um, this desire for all beings to be released from suffering, including us, including ourselves. And so we're, we're on this path of moving towards harmony and away from disharmony, as any, nat as any natural system shows us. And as we probably um, noticed in the practice tonight, these intentions can be moment to moment. And they can also be more overarching and provide like a framework or a, um, a whole life orientation, we might say, in which the moment to moment intentions are nested. Um, so these moment to moment intentions come out of these overarching um, guidelines, ethical guidelines, um, by which we live. So I'd just like to do a little experiment right now, just so that we can see the, the, um, the actuality of intention. So sitting here now and not moving yet, if I invite you to bring both your hands together in front of your chest, in a very simple prayer, prayer pose, but not moving yet, just sitting with that, in, with, with that invitation. So even before you move, 
just hearing those words of invitation, what happens? Keeping the invitation present and not moving. What does that intention, that impetus or urge feel like in the body? And how does it feel in the heart and the mind? And this is very subtle, so it's, it's difficult to grasp sometimes. For me, there's, a, there's an immediate urge, like an upwelling of energy in my body. It's like a up through the solar plexus and into the, into the shoulders because I, I can feel already the body urging me towards this movement. And so this is, this is intention. This is what the Buddha refers to as intention. And we feel this when we're doing walking meditation on a retreat, for example, where the intention to move can really be a, a, a very um, expansive meditation in itself. Like what, what propels us to actually start the, our, foots, our feet moving forward? So when we move into this posture, we realize that our mind and body are already there. So the invitation here is now to, to move into that posture, but recognizing that the hands in front of the chest were already there before we took that action. So this speaks to the power of intention. And what makes it such a powerful tool in our, in, in our mindfulness practice. And this is, um, I'd just like to mention here too, that intention in this context isn't the same as goal. So goal has like an end point in mind. Um, something like in two years time, I'm going to finish my master's degree, for example. So that's, that's, a, that's a, um, a thought of where we want to be at a certain time. But intention is a, is a more, a very subtle um, impetus. It, it forms a framework or, or orientation um, by which we, we do other actions or do all actions, in fact. And there's some beautiful images that uh, give us a sense of this. So one is an arrow. The Buddha used the, uh, used the um, image of an arrow many times in his teaching. And the arrow, when it's held alongside the body in the, within the bow, and it's not yet released, so that the direction and the aim is set before the arrow is released. And this is what provides the impetus for action. So this is, this is what intention is. Or we could say it's like a seed. So it's, it's this tiny concentrated pod that provides the impulse for life um, to grow into a full-sized yellow box tree, for example. Another image which is helpful is like a, is a, comf a compass, which uh, gives us direction to go down a certain path. And this image is used in the Satipatthana Sutta beautifully uh, right at the beginning when the Buddha talks about the, um, the practice of Satipatthana or the four foundations of mindfulness being like a direct or being, it is a direct path to liberation. And another, another uh, image which is often used is a guiding light or beacon. So just as we using the image of the seed now, just as we can't tell from looking at a seed, for example, what, what form, you know, this yellow box tree is going to take or how sturdily it will grow or how tall it will get, um, how long it will live or even what unique features it's going to grow with. So we can't tell from our intentions that we hold what the results of our actions will be. Um, uh, I just, I, f I find this just um, so beautifully mysterious and so powerful. Um, yeah, it's such a, it just, it moves my heart every time I, I read those words. Because life is dynamic and unfolding moment by moment and the conditions change for that unfolding moment by moment in 
an unfathomable way. We cannot ever know. Um, we can never know the results of our actions. And this is where intention becomes so important because the intentions for our actions give us a direction, give our actions direction. So unlike the um, established Indian beliefs at the time of the Buddha's living in India, which was about a, a very direct and linear karma. So this will lead to that, will lead to that, will lead to that. The Buddha's teaching on karma, um, so this is on action, introduced a really a much more complex and uh, organic relationship between intention and result. And it's all about these multiple fallback loops, feed, feedback loops, sorry. So the present moment is shaped both by past actions, but it's also shaped by our present actions. And then our present actions shape not only the future, but also the present. So this is, I find this also fascinating that the, the present here becomes so powerful um, and it gives us such workability in, in every action that we take or everything that, that happens in our lives. We can always start where we are because there is some choice and will and our intentions can establish what is going to happen next. So all, all volition, all intention can be trapped, traced back to one of three unwholesome or, or wholesome roots. So the three unwholesome roots are greed, hatred, and delusion. These are what are called the three fires. And these are what um, underlie all of our, um, all of the, uh, the more, what we call it, you know, the neg negative, negative actions and negative um, mind states. And then the three wholesome roots are the opposites of those. So non-greed, non-ill will or non-hatred and non-delusion. So this is all about relationship we can see here. It's about the rela relationship between me, this being, and the intention I have, and then the action that results from that intention. And it all happens here and now. So, as I was saying, this is why we can never know the extent of our actions. But from a Buddhist perspective, if we're practicing living according um, to the Dharma, we are interested in relieving our lives and the lives of others um, of levels of suffering and disharmony and moving towards greater harmony. So living in accordance with the more wholesome roots of intention and action become um, paramount. And this is, uh, this is where the, the Buddha's eightfold path uh, becomes important in practice because he talks about wise intention or sometimes it's called uh, right intention or right resolve. This is the, se the second factor in the Noble Eightfold Path and it comes after wise view which is the first factor. So these, these two are very, um, very entwined and form the wisdom factors of the path. And they come before the three ethical factors, which are wise speech, wise action, and wise livelihood. So we can see the, um, the pattern here of intention for, and, and, and view forming the backbone or the, the framework within which we then act in the world. Um, and, 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 and whether that action is coming from a place of wholesomeness and harmony or whether it's coming from a place of disharmony and unwholesomeness.
So our view in, is important because it determines our thinking. Uh, so this is, this is where the view, view uh, intention and then action are all so intertwined and they don't, you know, one of them doesn't come before the other, they all strengthen and support each other. So our view determines our thinking and then our thinking determines our actions. And there's a beautiful, um, beautiful sutta uh, where the Buddha is teaching his son Rahula. And I go back to this sutta over and over, over the years. I think it's such a, a powerful sutta about the, the power of intention and action. So he basically says to Rahula, when you're considering doing or thinking or saying something in the future, reflect on it before you do it. And if you can see it would cause harm or pain in some way to yourself or others or to both, you should stop yourself from doing or thinking or saying that thing. If though you can see it wouldn't harm, cause harm or pain to yourself or others, or both, then go ahead and do it, or say it, or think it. Now this is, uh, I, I find this such an incredibly impossible task. Like if we're, usually we're, we're, we're moving so fast in our lives, right? And um, to stop ourselves before we think something, it sounds virtually impossible in our, in our lives these days. And I think it speaks to the, to the way that the Buddha um, is suggesting that we slow down and really take notice about of what's going on. And then the second part of the sutta, um, the Buddha talks about the present. So when you're already thinking, saying or doing something, reflect on that as well. So apply this same reflection and give it up immediately if you can see that harm or pain is being caused to yourself or others. And then if you've already thought, said or done something, and this is probably where we, where it is most applicable, most applicable in our lives. Again, we apply the same reflection. And he says to Rahula, if you see it, ha it has caused some harm or pain for yourself, others or both, Confess to it, actually acknowledge this is what's happened. I've hurt somebody and that hurts me or, or whatever the example is. And then talk with a trusted friend or a teacher about it. So this is about aerating and acknowledging what, what has happened and giving that space and actually recognizing what, what, it, what it means to, to feel that harm or feel that pain because we've caused harm. And then he says, refrain from thinking, doing and saying the same things in the future. Or on the other hand, if you've seen that you, you've, um, by that action you've created happiness or easeful consequences, then rejoice in your actions and see that this is the way to act in the future. And this then strengthens that relationship with, with wise thinking body, and, uh, body uh, actions and speech. So there's a few things here that I think are very powerful for our practice and for, and for the way we live in the world that comes from that sutta. And one, one is, you know, what, what the mind is doing right now. You know, absolutely the importance of this present moment that we're living in. And uh, Tanisaro Bhikkhu says, who you are or what you come from is not anywhere near as important as the mind's motives for what it is doing right now. The second thing here, and I'm just, I'm just going quickly now because I've only got a few minutes, but is the repetitive nature of reflection. And this is what the Buddha is saying is he, he actually ends the sutta to Rahula 
this, this um, teaching to Rahula on continually challenging ourselves regarding intention and motivation as a, you know, this continual practice. And the third thing that I draw from this sutta is that the, is the interdependent nature of all experience. You know, the teaching, this framework of paticca samupada or dependent arising that underlies all of, uh, underpins all of the Buddha's teaching. And the Buddha's explanation in the sutta of intention and karma and, uh, and how every moment is eminently workable. And that, that fills my heart with joy. So even as we continue to act less than carefully, and of course this, this continues to happen over and over as we, we practice and learn and practice and learn from our mistakes, hopefully. The mindful awareness that we create in the, in the present over and over through our practice then creates conditions for further mindful awareness in the future. So this clear, clearer seeing conditions further clearer seeing and sets up for conditions it sets up conditions for us to create a life of greater harmony in the body heart and mind as we see the results of both our skillful and unskillful patterns so by compassionately and sometimes Fiercely, we need to sit fiercely, um, as well as with gentleness, to sit and meet what's arising in us and around us. And you know, this is a this is a very powerful practice, I think, in the world right now, to be able to sit and meet what's arising uh, when we watch the news or see what's happening around us. Our practice becomes a heartfelt and healing um, investigation. We look, we look underneath to underneath the surface to really understand what's happening um, in each moment with our intentions and actions. And you know, we we, we see that you know our, our hearts and minds are veiled by layers of perceptions and views and beliefs. And the practice, as the Buddha explained to Rahula, is about pulling aside this failing and understanding our motives and learning to see the patterns that fuel our thinking and action. So sitting on the cushion with such intentions allows us to do the inner work necessary to, to act wisely in the world and to bring change to the wider world. And these two things aren't separate. Um, and the activist writer Al Nur Lada says, which I, I, I just heard this recent, heard him say this recently and loved it. Meditation is the prerequisite of the revolution. But the revolution and the healing that the world needs now is one steeped in ethics and acknowledgement of our deep connections. And I think this is only possible when we understand the territory of our own heart and mind. So when we can stand here on the earth grounded, understanding the basis of our own suffering and the base and the basis of our own liberation through these um, these two paths, these this path that fuels the more wholesome and, and then the path that fuels the, the less wholesome or, or the disharmonious, we can actually meet and hold this in others. And I think. This, this is so badly needed in the world right now. And then with that understanding, we can contribute in whatever way we're called to engage in the world with others, with ourselves. And then we can, and through that, we can engage with honesty and integrity and wisdom. And I think that is such a gift to the world that all of us can, can offer. Okay, I'm going to finish there. Thank you so much for listening.